From 12 News, this is Newsmakers. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Ted Nisi. Tim White is on assignment this week. Uh, a bombshell in Washington earlier this week where a leaked draft opinion from the U.S. Supreme Court a majority of the justices poised to overturn the landmark Roe v. Wade decision that legalized abortion rights across the country in the 1970s. And that's where we want to begin our conversation today with our guest, Massachusetts Congressman Jake Auchincloss. Congressman, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So first, I just want to ask, you know, I know as a reporter, I was stunned. It took me a second to realize what had happened, that a court opinion had leaked. What was your reaction when you saw the news? It's a travesty. Court watchers we're not surprised by the direction that the court is headed. I think dating back to 2016, a lot of experts were predicting that something like this would happen. All of us, though, were surprised by the degree that the court went here in its draft opinion, taking aim not just at women's right to an abortion, but really at the whole panoply of civil rights that have, a, have accumulated over the last 50 years. And Congress needs to act right now to codify Roe into national law. Because regardless of what the final ruling states, we know that we cannot trust the Supreme Court to uphold Roe. Here in the House, we passed the Women's Health Protection Act last year. And that would guarantee every woman in America access to reproductive health care, as is their human right. The Senate has not even taken it up yet. Chuck Schumer has said that he will. And Americans deserve to see where their senators stand on this issue. But Ted, you and I both know that it's not going to pass the Senate. Mm -hmm. And that's because of the filibuster. And at this point, I question whether you can be pro-filibuster and pro-choice at the same time. Well, I want to talk more about that bill and kind of the legislative strategy. But just before we dive into the, the meat of it, I do have to ask, what do you make of the leak itself, um, which I think also shocked Washington, the idea of a fully drafted opinion leaking out of the Supreme Court? What did you make of that? The leak is unprecedented in modern times, as you say. And it is true that draft opinions oftentimes change and justices change both the tone, tenor, and actual even verdict itself as they debate it. It should not become standard practice in the Supreme Court to have leaks. I think that undermines the integrity of the institution. But that also should not be the story right now. The story right now is that Justice Alito thinks that he knows better than 170 million American women. Well, let's talk then about um, abortion rights and where they go from here. First, I want to ask how you view Massachusetts and Rhode Island have both passed in recent years uh, state level laws codifying abortion rights. So to what extent, if this uh, draft comes down as a pro-choice lawmaker, do you view this as you know, uh, largely an, an immediate concern for in red states where abortion might be banned, but not as much of a day-to-day -day concern here in New England where state legislatures have taken action and, and it's going to go to the states. There's a few things to unpack here. So first of all, you're of course right. Massachusetts passed the Roe Act in 2020, took, I believe, two overrides of the governor's veto to get it done, but it got done. And that guarantees that Massachusetts women are going to have access to abortions regardless of what the Supreme Court rules. That's important. I'm also proud to say that the state house is looking to pass up to $2 million in funding to make Massachusetts a safe haven state, which is going to be critical because when the court overturns Roe, and unfortunately it is looking like a when, not an if, Somewhere between 24 to 26 states in the union are going to have trigger laws that either immediately outlaw abortion or severely restrict access to it. And we're going to have to, working with organizations like Planned Parenthood, provide cross-state medical services to women in those reproductive health care deserts, as well as mail-order medications to women in those, uh, in those states. And Massachusetts can be a leader on this issue like it is in so many health care issues. However, I don't want us to be overly sanguine about this. Because even in states that have codified Roe at the state level, there is a chance, given this draft opinion, that the Supreme Court could go even further and say that actually state level laws that are legalizing abortion are themselves subject to judicial re review. And other civil rights that we have achieved over the last half century, same sex marriage, uh, access to contraception, for example, could also come up for debate, and that affects all Americans. I think a lot of people, uh, there are folks, even if they were shocked by the leaked opinion this week, that still sounds radical. That still sounds beyond even what, because there was, as you said, a lot of talk that Roe was on the chopping block now that um, President Trump had secured a conservative majority. The idea of them going all the way to contraception state level laws still feels, you know, I won't say it's a scare tactic, but feels like, feels like it's beyond where they would go. I think we're gonna see in the midterm elections whether or not, uh, your point resonates with the Democratic base or whether they do view this as an alarm bell in the night. But make no mistake, there is a 6-3 majority on the Supreme Court that 
given the tenor of this draft opinion, is throwing into question a whole series of civil rights that have been interpreted into the Constitution that are not explicitly drafted in, into the Constitution that they do not think have historical standing. And it is a highly subjective determination of what has historical standing and what doesn't, but we should not rest on our achievements. We are seeing for the first time really in my lifetime a right be rolled back. What are the next rights? Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the Women's Health Protection Act. You mentioned it before. You voted for it last September. It's the bill Democrats support um, to codify a statutory right to abortion. Just yesterday, Maine U.S. Senator uh, Susan Collins, Republican, who is pro-choice, said she can't support that bill. She thinks it doesn't protect the rights, for example, of a Catholic hospital not to perform abortions. You know, as you said, the filibuster is in place. There aren't the votes to overrule the filibuster, which means you need 60 votes right now in the Senate to pass anything on abortion. And you would need someone like Susan Collins. Should Democrats be revising the bill you passed in the House to try to win over a Susan Collins, a Lisa Murkowski? If there were a path to 60 votes in the Senate to codify Roe, of course we should be working to get those votes because this is a critically important issue and there is no such thing of let, as letting perfect be the enemy of the good right now. We, we need to deliver something for uh, Americans. So absolutely. But there is no good faith debate on the other side of the aisle right now. We're hearing Susan Collins, one of the 50 that we would potentially need, offer a few ideas on the margins. It's just, it's just clear that the Republican Party does not want to protect women's control over their own bodies right now. I, I have to say, as a political reporter looking out, there aren't the votes to overcome the filibuster. There aren't even 50 votes for an abortion bill right now, let alone 60. Republicans are in strong shape to take back the Senate, if not this year, in the next cycle or two. It's hard to see a path where Democrats can get the numbers they need legislatively to do something on abortion rights in the, even in the medium term. Well, voters are, are going to decide who holds the House and the Senate. And this issue, I expect, will be a galvanizing one because the stakes are so clear right now and the Republicans are so crystal clear about where they stand uh, and that they stand out of step with the majority of Americans. Six months, as you know, in politics is an eternity. Mm -hmm. uh, are we facing headwinds right now? Yes, we are. But we need to reinforce what Democrats are delivering, a record job creation recovery, uh, return to normalcy after two years of the pandemic, strong, able statesmanship uh, facing global challenges. Record inflation. Uh, Critically, uh, critical inflation issues that are causing real pain at the kitchen table, but Republicans have yet to present a plan of action to counteract it. They are playing political football with it. I'm the vice chair of the Financial Services Committee. We deal with this issue day in, day out. I've offered a suite of suggestions that Republicans could join on to. All we hear is I'm trying to, to take on talking points. Uh, we are working right now on the America Competes Act. That's investments in the supply chain, in manufacturing and workforce development to help make America more productive. The Federal Reserve is raising interest rates. Uh, there's no overnight solution to inflation. Americans know that. Uh, but Democrats have a plan. Republicans have a tax. But, you know, let's go to inflation because, uh, you know, Democrats passed the American Rescue Plan Act last year, $1.9 trillion. And when I've asked other Democrats this, they say, and, they, and look at all the, the good things we put into the American Rescue Plan Act. But you listen to economists, a lot of them say, that was maybe more money than this economy could handle, especially with the supply chain issues we have. Do, in retrospect, it was one of the first votes you took, I believe. Do you, in retrospect, think that bill was too big based on what the economy's done since? I think we were facing an unprecedented crisis. And there were two options there. One was go small and deal with the effects of it being too small. And we saw what happened when, that, when we did that with the Great Recession back in 2008 and 9. It was too small, and the economy staggered for years with slow growth, slow job creation. Or it was risk going too big, and cutting child, childhood poverty by 30 to 40 percent, having record job creation, uh, investing in state and local infrastructure, and yes, potentially heating the economy up a little bit. The real driver of inflation, though, right now, is the fact that we've had a pandemic for the last two years the world's largest supplier, China, has shut down its economy, which has roiled supply chains. We've got a war between two countries that are huge exporters of oil and wheat, uh, critical commodities. And as, at the same time as America is recovering and demand is surging, supply chains are compressed. Hence the America Competes Act. We are investing directly in domestic supply chains and workforce productivity, and we are going to get back to a place where we can have growth without inflation. Some are suggesting that one way to provide immediate relief to Americans, especially because of the way Ukraine and energy costs, and this suspend the federal gas tax temporarily. What do you think? Uh, I think that is not going to be very effective. What we should be doing, though, is looking at big oil's supply chains because they are racking in excess profits right now. Um, and 
there's a real question about whether they're war profiteering. And we need to look at how those excess profits can be passed on to lower prices for consumers at the pump. All right, I want to stick with domestic issues because we're going to talk of foreign policy a bit in the back half of this show. One, another issue that's dividing your party right now is Title 42, which is it can be a little hard to understand, but it's, it's a pandemic era rule that has been restricting immigration and asylum seekers. Even some in your party who dislike Title 42 because they're supporters of immigration are, are concerned that removing it without a plan for the expected surge in migrants by the Biden administration is a bad idea. How are you satisfied with what you've heard from the White House about how they're going to handle this if that does go away and I know there's now a judicial ruling but if it's if it is lifted as the CDC wants well I don't think there's any divide in the party that we need to plan to lift title 42 without question title 42 is a public health measure it's not immigration measure and it is a short-term solution for the uh, exigencies of the pandemic the pandemic we're putting it in the rearview mirror and we need to have real immigration policy the US Citizenship Act which I co-sponsored and which reflects the president's immigration policy has real ideas for how to do that. We are going to invest more in technology and infrastructure for the border. We are going to guarantee rule of law and humanitarian considerations at the border. And we want to have an orderly process for immigrants to seek a better life here in the United States. Republicans aren't even willing to debate it on the House floor. Again, we don't have counter proposals that are workable from the other party right but now. But your party controls uh, Congress and the White House. It's, isn't it incumbent on all of you to figure out, especially something like this that is in the end an executive branch decision to remove this right now? And the president in his State of the Union said, I want to work with Republicans on opioids, for example. We are seeing historic surge of fentanyl across the border. We're seeing sex trafficking across the border. We need to address these. These are bipartisan issues. And, you know, it said two weeks ago I was Speaker Pro Tem, which means that I am holding the gavel and listening to both parties give their speeches at the end of the voting block. And I always an interesting time in the House so always, span if anyone's ever tuned in for those. Yeah, <laughs> always an education for a fresh <laughs> member of Congress. Yeah. And I heard the Republicans come up and talk about immigration. What I heard from them was was they said, you know, Democrats hate this country. They don't believe in the rule of law. They want there to be drugs coming into the country because they want to get Republican voters addicted to fentanyl. I mean, they're saying ridiculous things. I heard not a single concrete proposal from the other party on this issue. We have a real problem at the border. Nobody on either side of the aisle is refuting that. Democrats have put forward a plan. It's called the U.S. Citizenship Act. It is investments in the border. It is investments in the triangle countries to try to stem the flow of migrants. It is guaranteeing the rule of law and humanitarian considerations for all people trying to cross the border. I haven't heard a substantive debate from the other side yet. All right, we're going to take a break on Newsmakers. When we come back, we're going to talk more with our guest, Massachusetts Congressman Jake Auchincloss, about the war in Ukraine and where it goes from here. Stick with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Ted Nisi. Tim White is on assignment. Our guest this week, Massachusetts Congressman Jake Auchincloss, Democrat, represents the 4th District, which stretches from up in Newton, your territory, all the way down into Fall River. All of Fall River in the new one, which we'll, we'll talk about in a little while. But I want to I want to go to the war in Ukraine. You've, mm -hmm. you've spoken out a lot about that, and uh, you served in the Marines, so you've served overseas and thought about military policy quite a bit. Uh, we've seen the White House push back this week at reporting in the New York Times about the assistance the U.S. is giving to Ukraine and targeting Russian generals, sinking that big warship. Uh, it, it would appear the pushback is because they are worried about widening the war, especially as Vladimir Putin seems cornered. How big a concern is that for you as we head into, what, the third? We're heading into three, four months of this war. Well, the administration is being statesmanlike here. The first rule of Fight Club is you don't talk about Fight Club. The administration is not going to be talking about everything it's doing to help the Ukrainians. But suffice to say that when it comes to firepower, when it comes to training, and when it comes to intelligence support, the United States is going to be in lockstep with, with whatever the Ukrainian forces need to fight back against this unlawful invasion. Uh, the war took a turn on April 19th. It pivoted from an attack on the capital, where it was a, more, a war of a maneuver, to uh, a Russian focus on the east. They are trying to annex the Donbass and dismember Ukraine. Uh, they're trying to landlock the country and be able to declare that the populations that are Russian speaking in the east are really going to be functionally subject to Russia. That cannot stand. It needs to be the bipartisan policy of the United States that our objective is total and complete victory for a free and democratic Ukraine and defeat for the Kremlin. But, you know, and some would say, well, then perhaps we have to start thinking about a point where we authorize U.S. and NATO military action in Ukraine. I know everyone instantly says that's World War III. And uh, also on some level, 
you know, we already are quite involved, even if there's nothing official there. You know, balancing the risks against what you just said should be the goal. Could you ever see reaching that point or are the risks just too high? But then if the risks are too high, do you end up in this stalemate where we can't quite do enough to push Ukraine all the way to victory? Direct U.S. military invention is escalatory and is not at this point necessary. The two most important things we can do to support Ukraine right now are one, a blank check for materiel uh, intelligence and training support, which we are providing. And every classified briefing I've received has improved my confidence that anything that the Ukrainians need and can use, we are providing and our NATO allies are doing likewise. And number two is to coordinate a global blockade on Russian oil exports. Oil money is fueling the Russian war machine as they commit atrocities in Ukraine. The United States and Canada have stopped importing Russian oil. Europe is moving towards uh, stopping importing Russian oil. And now working with our European allies, we need to uh, wield primary and secondary sanctions to prevent China and India from picking up that slack. Our goal should be to get Russia from exporting about 8 million barrels a day down to being able to export only about 4 million barrels a day. That will have seismic impacts on its ability to fund not just its government operations back home, but more importantly, its military operations in Ukraine. And yet I imagine, I picture Vladimir Putin in the Kremlin. Uh, he's already, we know by all reports, a paranoid individual to some extent. We saw him take this step that many Russian uh, elites apparently didn't think he would even go to war here. He keeps at least alluding to the use of nuclear weapons, which he has quite a few of. Uh, you know, I, I guess how do you how do you how do you think about that? The risk of Putin, you know, the the madman theory that he could just do something that we don't expect or that we fear he might do because he's because we're winning or, or Ukraine is winning with America's support. Anytime you're engaging with a nuclear armed country, their threats need to be taken seriously. Uh, but we are not going to blink on what our objectives are. The Kremlin understands the repercussions of using nuclear weapons. And uh, Joe Biden's statesmanship over the last five months has improved our credibility on the world stage after the disaster of the four years of the Trump administration. And we are now able to stand with our NATO allies and make very clear the iron resolve of the West that Ukraine is going to be free, democratic and sovereign, and that this type of might makes right foreign policy just doesn't have a place in the post-war international rules-based order. One more uh, on Ukraine. Uh, you, you were one of the few Democrats who was willing to speak out pretty strongly in defense of the withdrawal from Afghanistan, where you served when that happened, although you, I think, too, acknowledged it, it could have gone better, uh, the pullout. There are Republicans in particular, but I've heard some uh, Democrats and military analysts say the, that decision may have uh, led Vladimir Putin to think to underestimate U.S. resolve in Ukraine and potentially invade the country because he thought America's done with these foreign interventions. They're not going to be willing to do that. What do you think of that theory that the Afghanistan pullout may have given the wrong impression of Putin and part of how we ended up here? None of us, me, experts, can get inside Vladimir Putin's head. It's clearly a deranged place. And given that he lied face to face to President Xi just weeks before his invasion, I think we should all be very, very uh, humble in our ability to predict what his cost benefit calculations were. What I can say with absolute certainty, though, is that the ability of Americans to be united on this issue domestically, Republicans and Democrats alike, is critical. And the ability of Americans and Europeans and our East Asian allies to be united on a global energy blockade will change his calculations. How concerned are you about your party losing control of Congress in the midterms? Uh, we have to be concerned. We're facing headwinds. There's no question about it. Uh, but we have six months, and six months is a long time. We have got to be clear about what Democrats are delivering, job creation, uh, solid foreign policy, a return to normalcy. And we've got to be clear what the stakes are. We've got a Republican Party right now that no longer believes in free and fair elections. We've got a Republican Party that is totally subject to Donald Trump's whims. Uh, the winner of the Ohio primary for Senate, J.D. Vance, was very clear that he doesn't care what happens to Ukraine. It's someone else's problem. That's not the kind of leadership that we want in Congress. That's not the kind of people we want representing us. And we're going to make very clear what the distinctions are on the ballot in November. You, uh, you know, your own political positioning, you know, we're, we sometimes say you're more of a moderate congressman, at least in this region. I think, I don't know if you'd look moderate if you were held in Alabama district, but that's, that's New England politics for you. There are those in your party who feel that those further out to the left, some of the rhetoric they use, some of the policies they've pushed, are part of why your party is, is having problems right now, because those messages have scared kind of voters in the middle. How concerned are you about whether the sort of vocal vanguard of progressive is, progressives in your party are making it harder for Democrats to get their message across to 
more moderate centrist swing voters? There's, we're a big tent party, and there's no question that when you're a big tent party and you've got a broad coalition, one of the uh, guiding principles needs to be that you should do no harm that what you're saying in one district doesn't reverberate to a different district in a way that becomes a liability. I think that's just good political practice. Uh, but we, we shouldn't overstate the divides within the Democratic Party. There is a strong consensus towards a number of objectives that we have in the next six months. We want to institute Medicare negotiation of drug prices to step up taxes on high earners and corporations in order to pay for substantial investments in clean energy and climate resilience. Uh, this is something that we can achieve, and this is something that is popular with voters. This is something that we can campaign on. Let's talk about uh, last year's redistricting process where you were a winner. You wanted all of Fall River into the fourth district. I think I laughed when you said that, but you actually <laughs> did get all. You said on this show last summer, and you did get all of Fall River uh, into the fourth, despite uh, protests from your colleague, Congressman Keating, who wanted to keep the half-ish of the city that he had. You know, I heard from some folks uh, down here and on Beacon Hill who thought you had pretty sharp elbows in that uh, debate about how to redistrict uh, Massachusetts. Do you have any regrets about how you uh, handled that redistricting fight behind the scenes? No, because we surfaced the opinion of residents of Fall River, the mayor, the state representative from Fall River, leaders of businesses and uh, labor organizations all said, it's important to us that Fall River be the biggest city in its district, that it be the flagship city in its own district, and that its concerns uh, be front and center for the next member of Congress, whoever it might be. That's the right thing for Fall River, and I am uh, proud that we got that accomplished. But you also heard from people who thought that was naive of Fall River leaders, even if they had numerically more people, knowing the, the wealth, the power, the influence of the Yes, smaller population communities up at the top of the district, like Newton, like Brookline. I mean, how, you know, maybe you are prioritizing Fall River, but how can they how can they be sure that down the line they're still going to have that kind of influence if, if somebody wins more from up there and doesn't doesn't care as much about down here? Uh, well, I think population matters. That's why it's important to have the whole city in the district because it's just more votes uh, at the table. But also, just look at the track record. Barney Frank, Joe Kennedy, me, uh, we have all worked hard to deliver for Fall River uh, in the last appropriation cycle and in this upcoming appropriation cycle, we have delivered uh, funding for uh, infrastructure improvements for the waterfront to help economic development there. Work very closely with the mayor, with the state senator, with the state representative, because it takes local state federal alignment to, uh, to deliver for the city, and that's gonna to continue to be a priority of mine. Congressman Kennedy, uh, I remember in an exit interview with him, he talked about just how much he felt Beacon Hill and kind of Boston folks didn't understand sort of day-to-day -day concerns of Fall River and New Bedford, though that's not in the 4th District, so the 9th, um, and how, you know, it's just the, the feeling down here that people often have that they're kind of overlooked is a valid one. He felt like someone who sort of went back and forth because of the way the northern part of the district is. Do you see that as someone now representing the city? Yes, and I think it's a problem beyond just Massachusetts, it is a problem for Democrats as a party broadly, and I say that as a, as a Democrat, that we can be condescending at times. We can be a party that prescribes to people, that lectures people about what is best for them as opposing to enlisting people in a vision that they share, that they believe in. And we've gotta watch that because it is damaging to the Democratic brand and it's off-putting to voters. Um, your 2020, your leading primary opponent last time, Jesse Mermel, just announced she won't seek a primary rematch against you. In part, she's dealing with the recent death of her father after a long instance. Your Republican opponents have also dropped out since uh, the, the start of this election cycle, which means you currently have no opponents that I'm aware of, at least out of this morning, in your very first re-election race. I'm sure you're not upset about that. But I also have to ask, you know, is it good for democracy for a freshman congressman to already have be totally unopposed in an election? Well, I can't control other people's decisions, obviously. I represent 800,000 people. I make decisions about what's best for 800,000 constituents of mine. I don't make those decisions based on what it might induce one or two of them to either run or not run. And this cycle, nobody thought that they were gonna win. Next cycle, that might change. 
doesn't change how I do my job. How I do my job is representing people's values, advancing their priorities, and delivering excellent constituent services. Big election year in Massachusetts for other folks, though. Um, uh, Charlie Baker, of course, is retiring. Who are you supporting in the Democratic primary for governor? You will hear from me on that soon. Oh, well, that's a, that's a good tease, as we say in television. <laughs> do you expect to make other endorsements in the statewide primary races? It can be a sensitive thing for the members of Congress, how much they want to dabble at the state level. We'll look at it race by race. Okay, okay. Um, 30 seconds left. Uh, I remember interviewing you as a Newton City Council I'd never heard of. Now you're a first-term congressman. What's the biggest difference between what you thought it would be like to be in Congress and what it's actually like? 30 seconds. Oof. Uh, I'll tell you this. The most frustrating part is seeing the divergence between what's actually happening in Congress and what we can accomplish in Congress and how it how Americans perceive of what's happening in Congress. We've got a real trust deficit, and that's partly on us, and it's partly on how it's being portrayed, and I find it very frustrating. The best part of it is uh, getting to call up these kids who want to join the military academies, and they've worked so hard for it, and tell them, you got an appointment to the United States Military Academy at West Point. You got an appointment to Annapolis. It's uh, inspiring. I can imagine that being a, a big moment. All right, Massachusetts Congressman Jake Auchincloss, that's all the time we have this week. Tim White will be back next week with me here on Newsmakers. Thanks for joining us.